Hi, it's Kate, and this is the first video for week, oh geez, eight of Math 23B. We're in the home stretch now. This is our last module before the final exam. So in light of that, it may seem like a little bit of a shifting of gears. We are going to be introducing a few new concepts and then tying together a bunch of things to create a story about one of the biggest theorems in calculus, so I hope you all really enjoy it. The first thing that I need to do is I need to introduce you to what's called a differential form. Now, there are all different uh, sized differential forms. There are one forms, two forms, three forms, any number. A, a differential k form, whatever k the number is, is a function of k vectors in Rn. It acts on k vectors and it spits out a scalar. There are a couple other things that you should know about a k form. Like the determinant function, it has the following properties. It's multilinear, it's anti-symmetric, and it's normalizing. Now, despite the use of the adjective differential in the letter D, a differential form is a purely algebraic concept. We are not taking derivatives yet. You now may be wondering, how exactly do I compute a k-form? Well, let's start with just a one-form. A one-form, dxi, acts on a vector linearly by extracting the ith component. So for instance, if we have this vector v, and we have the one-form dx2 act on it, it's going to extract the second component, which happens to be a 5. So dx2 acting on v will equal 5. Similarly, dx4 acting on v will extract the fourth component and will equal 2. Differential forms are elements of an abstract vector space. So from basis forms like dx2 and dx4, you can create more complicated linear combinations of these. For instance, check out uh, phi here, right? Phi is 2 times dx2 plus dx4. And so by linearity, you can compute this by individually computing what dx2 and dx4 would be on a particular vector. In this case, phi acting on v would be 2 times 5 plus 2, which is equal to 12. Okay, so those are one forms. Let's move on to two forms. A two form is written using two basis one forms and the wedge symbol. So note that we have our two basis one forms here. We have dx1 and dx3, and in between we have this weird sort of pointing upward caret, which we call a wedge. Now dx1 wedge dx3 will turn out to equal the wedge product, that's what we call this, of dx1 and dx3. But you should view a basis form like this just as a single entity, even though it technically is equal to the wedge product of dx1 and dx3. So be aware that there are two possible interpretations there. You can think of this as the wedge product of these two basis one forms, but you can also think of this single term as just one entity by itself. Now what does a two form do? When you take dxi and dxj and create the two form here, dxi wedge dxj, it acts on an ordered pair of vectors. Note that it now requires two vectors, v and w in a manner that's linear in each argument. And what ends up happening is that it extracts the ith row and the jth row, and it creates a two by two matrix uh, of the ith and jth rows in the vectors v and w, and it calculates the determinant of that matrix. Sorry, I quite desperately needed to scroll down there. So if you have two different vectors, this is our v1 and v2, these are the two vectors that this two form is going to be acting on. And if you take dx2 wedge dx3 and you act on v1 and v2, it's going to extract the second row of these two vectors. So here we're looking at 5 and 7. You can see that becomes the first row of this matrix. And then the third row, which we can see is 1 and 3, that becomes the second row of the matrix. And then it calculates the determinant of the resulting matrix here, which happens to be 8. Now the use of determinants in this definition guarantees that this uh, two form will be linear and anti-symmetric and the fact that dx1 wedge dx2 of uh, sequential standard basis vectors will be one provides normalization. So, so far we've discussed one forms, 
two forms, which you should think about both as entities on their own, but also as wedge products of two one forms, two basis one forms, I should say. And then there are three forms. Now, following this pattern, three forms require three vectors as their arguments, and the way we write them is as follows. We take dx1 wedge dx2 wedge dx3, right? Those are three basis one forms, and we use the wedge symbol between each of them. So what happens? Just like with two forms, what ends up happening is we take a look at the index here, and it says, okay, with these three vectors, extract the first row, then extract the second row, then extract the third row, and create a matrix where this is the first row, the matrix, the second row, the matrix, the third row, the matrix, and calculate the determinant of that. So of course, if we're going in order here, that means that if we're taking dx1, wedge dx2, wedge dx3 of v1, v2, v3, we're just going to get the determinant of the matrix whose columns are v1, v2, and v3. Now, when we're talking about these in general, there's a notational issue where we just need to go over exactly how we talk about them. The k forms on Rn are elements of an abstract vector space denoted by this notation. So this right here, A, with the superscript k, with Rn in parentheses, is the k forms on Rn. Every single time we get to the final exam, I always have at least one or two students come up to the front and say, I don't know what this means. This is the space of k forms on Rn, and I can't answer that question in the exam. It should be something that you realize, but it's really, since we're usually bogged down in specifically computing particular three forms or two forms or what have you, um, you know, it's, it's a rare occurrence where you're talking about them in theory, but it certainly does happen several times over the course of the semester. It's just very easy to sort of ignore when that comes up. So A, superscript K, Rn means the space of K forms on Rn. Now, since there's one independent basis K form for each way of choosing a subset of the N components of the argument vectors, the dimension of this space is equal to N choose K, right? That's the binomial coefficient. So the dimension of the space of K forms on Rn is N choose K. That is, I think, pretty clear. Think about it if you have two forms on R3, right? That would be 3 choose 2 because you could use dx1 wedge dx2 is one uh, element of that basis. You could use dx1 wedge dx3, that's another element of the basis, and dx2 wedge dx3, that's another element of the basis. So that's how you would end up with 3 which is what 3 choose 2 is equal to. Now suppose phi is an arbitrary element of the space of k forms in Rn. Remember phi, we gave a few examples of what they could be like 2dx1 plus 3dx2 or something like that. So all we know about phi is that it's multilinear and alternating. And in order to be able to express phi as a linear combination of basis forms, you actually have to know the value of phi on every possible sequence of k standard basis vectors. So due to anti-symmetry, it's sufficient to know the value of phi on every sequence where the basis vectors are in order, because any time you swap them out of order, that would multiply the whole thing by negative one because of this calculation similarity to the determinant, that anti-symmetry. Now, if you take a look at this, this is just writing out what we discussed above, which is that I want to take a look at phi and see what its value is on every sequence where the basis vectors are in order. So we have our sum here. Here we have our scalar multiples, whatever those may be, depending on what we're trying to calculate. Our various uh, basis k forms here. And of course, this stipulation here that i1 should be less than i k, etc., etc., is saying that this basis vector should be in order. With this, we can now define the wedge product of, say, a k form and an l form on Rn. Now, here's the rule for doing this in such a way that the product of two basis forms is a basis k plus l form. So, for instance, you have a one form here and a two form here, and what you end up with is, is a three form. Now, the way to calculate these as they get more and more complicated 
is what you want to do is you want to extract a subset of k vectors to feed to the first factor. Remember in this particular case, k equals 1, because we're dealing with the k form over here, which is a 1 form in our example. So first you're going to say, okay, v1 is what this 1 form is going to act on. Then v2 and v3 are left over for the 2 form to act on it. See, note, leaving a subset of l vectors to feed to the second factor. And when it, within each subset, you need to keep the vectors in order. So it's not so bad when you say, okay, v1 goes to the 1 form and v2 and v3 go to the 2 form, but then the question is what happens then when you add on v2 going to the 1 form, and now you want v1 and v3 going to the 2 form. When you take a look at this and consider the fact that, okay, v2 went to the 1 form, v1 and v3 go to the 2 form, that means that our order is now v2, v1, v3, which is out of order by one swap, so we would have to swap and multiply this, uh, what we would then compute, by negative 1, because it takes one swap for it to get back into cyclical order. Now if you add on, if v3 is what is acted on by the 1 form, and v1 and v2 are acted on by the 2 form, you now have v3, v1, v2. That takes two swaps to get it into v1, v2, v3 order. So that would be negative 1 squared, so it's going to have a positive factor on it. So we can do this in a sort of basic way, just looking at how you have two one forms that work with a to combine together to make a two form. Let's take a look at that. What we're saying by this example is that this is really the wedge product of a one form and a one form together that creates a basis two form. But the way to compute this is to say, okay, which one is going to go to this one form first? First, I'm going to pick V1 that leaves v2 for dx2 to act on it. Then we need to acknowledge the other possibility, which is that dx1 may act on v2, which leaves dx2 to be the form that acts on v1. And we note that because these two are out of order, it takes one swap to get them in cyclic order, v1 to v2, that's negative 1 to the first power, so we want to put a subtraction sign out here. And lo and behold, we already knew that computing two forms was basically taking the first row of v1 and v2 and the second row of v1 and v2 and computing the determinant of that 2 by 2 matrix. And in fact, this is right here the actual formula for that, right? First row, first column of that matrix would be dx1, v1, times second row, second column would be dx2, v2, minus dx1, v2, right, times dx2, v1. So this is how we break down this two form into these one forms where you are taking the one form and having it act on each possibility, seeing what's left over and how many swaps are out of order. So that's how you can compute these k form wedged with an L form appropriately. You want to see, okay, what are the possible combinations of K vectors that I can feed to that first K form? What le is left over for that L form? How out of order is the entire sequence? I will then take negative 1, raise it to the number of swaps necessary to get it back in sequence, and make that the sign of that particular term. This is a little overwhelming. We're going to do a lot of practice in lecture this week on this particular computational aspect. It's important to note that for your proof 21.1, you're going to be discussing how to compute a particular two form in R3 known as phi. So it's basically this example, but where k is 2 and n is 3. And so basically proving this actual equality for that dimensional case. All right, moving on with these wedge products, what else do we know about them? With this particular definition, we can actually find the wedge product to be associative. And because of that fact, it's surprisingly difficult to prove this fact, even though it seems quite obvious. But we can write wedge products without parentheses. So this is equal to this, which is also equal to that. And the wedge product of two basis one forms is clearly anti-commutative, as I just showed uh, up there. 
if you follow that formula, it's quite straightforward. But what's basically happening is that when you compare this two form to this two form, it's equal to a pair of two by two determinants in which the rows have been exchanged. So it's multiplying the whole thing by negative one. The general rule is that the wedge product of a k form and an l form is anti-commutative only if both k and l are odd integers and otherwise it's commutative. That is going to be, this commutativity is going to be your proof 21.2. Last fact is that the wedge product is distributive with respect to addition using the associative and distributive laws plus the rule that the product is commutative if k or l is even but anti-commutative if both are odd. We can pretty easily calculate the wedge products of arbitrary forms like this one where you take dx plus 2dz wedge dy minus 3dz without ever having to use that general rule for the wedge product which was specifically proven for 21.1. You'll have a lot of practice um, computing these, and that's really the focus of the beginning of this week, of this particular module. I know everyone is craving to understand, you know, what are these useful for? Why am I doing this? And I fully appreciate that. And we will get to it, I promise. But the important part is that we get this under our belts first, introduce another important tool, and then sort of put these together to see how these concepts relate to each other within the lens of differential and integral calculus.